OK, let's take a look at that problem 20.12, which asks us to provide a name for the following compounds. We'll try and provide systematic and um, common names for all of them. We'll, we'll, we won't do it for all of them, but we'll try to keep the systematic maybe. Systematic in blue. We'll do the common in red maybe, something like that. OK, so the first one is an anhydride. If I had a three carbon carboxylic acid, that would be propanoic. If I use the systematic name, it would be propanoic acid. So what I do is I replace acid with anhydride. So the systematic name would be propanoic, anoic, and anhydride. And if I wanted to give it a, a common name, if I had a three carbon carboxylic acid, instead of propanoic acid, it's propionic acid. And thus I would call it propionic, propionic anhydride. The next one, I have an amide, same thing. <clears throat> if I have, <clears throat> excuse me, if I had a three carbon carboxylic acid, common name would be propanoic acid. So this is some kind of propionamide. I know it's going to end up with pro, no, propane amide. Sorry, my mistake. We're doing systematic first. And then the nitrogen has two phenyl groups on it. So I would call that NN diphenyl. So I'd call this NN diphenyl propane amide. And then if I wanted to give it a common name, I would call it NN diphenyl propion amide. So NN diphenyl propion amide. Next, we have a dicarboxylic acid. If I have one, two, three, four carbons, I can call that 1,4-butane dioic acid. So I would call that um, uh, dimethyl, um, dimethyl butanoate, but I think the easier way to name this is to just use the common name, which is usually what we do for these diesters. And since if we have a four carbon carboxylic acid um, with a carboxyl group here and here on carbons one and four, we call that succinic acid. God. Call that uh, succinic acid. So we would call this dimethyl succinate. So dimethyl, dimethyl, Succinate. I won't ask you to give the systematic name of a dicarboxyl or of a diester like this from a dicarboxylic acid. Uh, what about the next one? We have cyclobutane uh, carboxamide. So we said that when if if you have an amide coming off of a ring, we call it a carboxamide. So that's the only way we learned how to name it. And so we really only have one way to do this one. We have an ethyl and a methyl. We list those in alphabetical order. So we would call this N, N ethyl, N methyl, cyclo, cyclobutane carboxamide, carboxamide. Again, that's the only way we learned how to name those. The next one is a nitrile. And if I had a four carbon carboxylic acid, I could call this butanoic acid or butyric acid, pending. So if I used butanoic acid, which is the systematic name, I would call this uh, butanonitrile or butanonitrile, however you want to say it. So butanonitrile. But if I used the common name, I would call it butyronitrile. Butero nitrile. The next one is an ester. There's two possibilities for this one too. If I had a four carbon carboxylic acid, again, I would call that butanoic acid. So I would call this propyl butanoate. So propyl uh, butanoate. Whereas if I give it a common name, it would be propyl butyroate, uh, but butyrate, sorry. Propyl butyr eight. And the last one is an anhydride. So, I mean, you could call it 
butane dioic anhydride, um, but nobody would ever do that. We never do that for these difunctional carboxylic acids. We always use the co common names. And so if I have a four carbon dicarboxylic acid, well, we just saw this a second ago, right? We saw that right here. You would call that succinic acid. And so we would call this just succinic anhydride. Succinic, so let me pencil that in. So I guess it's a common name, so uh, let's see here. Succinic, succinic anhydride. Again, you could call it um, butane dioic anhydride, but we would never use that. The dicarboxylic acids, we always use the common names. Well, that covers a little bit of nomenclature of carboxylic acid derivatives. Not enough information there, huh? Let's try drawing some structures. Remember we saw that oxalic acid had only two carbons. This is the structure of oxalic acid. So if we have dimethyl oxalate, we're gonna draw the carbon skeleton like this, and then dimethyl. So we have a methyl on each of the oxygens. The next one is phenyl cyclopentane carboxylate. So we know cyclopentane carboxylate would be, this section would be a cyclopentane, and then we have a carboxyl group on it, right? That would be cyclopentane carboxylic acid. But to make the ester, we would put a phenyl group on here. So this would be phenyl cyclopentane carboxylate. The next one is N-methylpropionamide. So if I have propanoic acid, or sorry, propionic acid and propanoic acid, it would be this. And so if I convert that to an amide, I have my carbonyl, and now I have a nitrogen, and what's attached to it is one methyl group. So I have N-methyl, let me make that a little shorter, N-methyl, and then I also have a hydrogen like that. And the last one is propionyl chloride, so this is an acid chloride. Again, three carbons, so I have one, two, three. Propionic acid would be this, and so propionyl chloride would be that. And there you go. What's the only way to master all this nomenclature is to practice, practice, practice. And there are a bunch of good practice problems in our textbook. If you're solving it and there's any problems you can't figure out or you're just confused about the nomenclature, um, you can either go back in the book and try to figure it out or just shoot me an email and I'd be happy to help you through the nomenclature of any carboxylic acids and their derivatives. Well, I think the last section that we're going to cover today is the reactivity of carboxylic acid derivatives. And you could probably guess that if you look at something like a acid chloride, like I have shown here, that there's a dipole going towards the oxygen and a dipole going towards the chlorine. And so that means that this is going to be highly reactive as an electrophile. So carboxylic acid derivatives, derivatives what they all have in common is that they all have an electrophilic carbonyl carbon, some more electrophilic than others, right? The acid chloride is very reactive, whereas if you go down to something like the amide, it's not nearly as reactive. And the order of reactivity goes the acid chloride, anhydride, ester, and then finally the amide. And we're going to take a look at these in some detail. And in order to rationalize why they are ordered in this, why they're put in this order, um, we have to look at a host of things. We have to look at induction, resonance, sterics, and the quality of the leaving group, and that's what we're going to look at now. So let's start with the acid chloride, the most reactive of them all. Why is an acid chloride so reactive? Well, it says, you know, first of all, you could just take a look at the carbon of the carbonyl and say, well, you've got a dipole pulling in that direction, and you've got a dipole pulling in that direction which renders this carbon very partially positive. It's very susceptible to nucleophilic attack. That's looking at it from the point of view of induction. But if you look at it from the point of view of resonance, it gives you even more information. Check it out. We can draw a resonance structure where we have a positive charge right on that carbon, which shows that it has some partial positive character. And if you think, well, hold on, Mr. Dion, you can draw another resonance contributor where the positive charge is on the chlorine. Well, it turns out that this is actually not a significant contributor to the resonance hybrid. Why would that be? It's because chlorine 
is in the third period, third period, and carbon is in the second period. How do we form a pi bond? Right? If you wanted to form a pi bond between a carbon and a chlorine, overlap is the side to side overlap of two p orbitals, but you would have a 2p overlapping with a 3p, right? 2p and a 3p. And since their size difference is so pronounced, the orbital overlap is not that great. And therefore, this doesn't contribute very much to the resonance hybrid at all. And so we see, again, that that carbon has a positive charge um, shown on it in this resonance structure. And basically, the conclusion that I'm getting at is that from all of these, we see that the carbon in an acid chloride is extremely reactive, extremely electrophilic. Then if we go to the other extreme, if we go to the amide, you might say, well, hold on. Nitrogen is pretty electronegative. And so if I have an amide, don't I have, I'll just draw a secondary amide like this. Don't I have a dipole going this way and a dipole going that way? Sure you do. But remember that nitrogen is less electronegative than an oxygen that we'd, we would see in, in an ester or an anhydride, and it's less electronegative than the, car, the chlorine in an acid chloride. And so the induction isn't as strong as that in an ester, an anhydride, or an acid chloride. And then second of all, if we look at the resonance contributor, sure, we do see one where we have a positive charge right on that carbon, However, we do have another resonance contributor and it is a significant contributor to the resonance hybrid uh, where we have the positive charge on the nitrogen instead. In fact, we talked about this in organic chemistry one. We talked about this, you know, the uncharged amide, and we talked about this resonance structure and said, well, what is the hybridization of the nitrogen? Is it sp3 or is it sp2? And the conclusion that we came to is that the nitrogen is actually sp2 hybridized in an amide because the lone pair is delocalized, right? It's an allylic lone pair. And that is one of the reasons why um, um, peptides have, you know, specific conformations that you'll talk about in biochemistry when you study enzymes and proteins. Anyhow, that, that's neither here nor there right now. But, you know, further proof that this carbon nitrogen bond has significant double bond character is the barrier of rotation of this. The, you know, the barrier of rotation of this bond is very high. I think it's like 80 kilocalories per mole or something. And so we see that based on these two factors, that an amide is not very reactive towards um, nucleophiles. The carbon of the carbonyl is not very electrophilic. But now we're going to get into what is called nucleophilic acyl substitution. So aldehydes and ketones, you might think, well, what's the difference between an aldehyde and a ketone versus the carboxylic acid derivatives and carboxylic acids? Well, besides the oxidation state of the carbon, um, an R group, like an alkyl group or a hydrogen, those don't function as good leaving groups. Whereas if I have a chlorine, for example, in an acid chloride, let's just say you have a chlorine here. Chlorine's a great leaving group. That's the conjugate base of a strong acid. So that's where the difference begins, or one of the main differences. And that is why carboxylic acid derivatives can undergo a very important reaction that I want to show you before we take off for the weekend, which is nucleophilic acyl substitution, a very important mechanism and reaction for organic chemists. So let's take a look at this substitution reaction. Notice it's not an SN2 reaction doesn't say anything about SN2, and I'll show you why. Because the SN2 was a concerted mechanism, wasn't it? An SN2 mechanism was the nucleophilic attack and the loss of leaving group occurring simultaneously. However, now in the nucleophilic acyl substitution, the general mechanism is as such. We start out with our carbonyl, which has an sp2 hybridized carbon. Remember, an sp2 hybridized carbon is trigonal, trigonal planar. It's flat. Then it undergoes a nucleophilic attack to form what's called a tetrahedral intermediate, this thing right here, right? Because now the carbon is sp3 hybridized and thus it is tetrahedral. So this intermediate can then expel or lose the leaving group to reform the carbonyl. So the carbon goes back to being sp2 hybridized again. Now, 
we know is that a hydride and a carbanion, generally speaking, there are exceptions, but those are generally speaking very poor leaving groups. And that's why we don't see aldehydes and ketones undergoing nucleophilic acyl substitution, unlike we do see with acid chloride. So take a look at this here. This would be benzoyl chloride, right? If you take benzoic acid, you replace it with oil chloride. So this would be benzoyl chloride. If we treat that with methoxide, what happens after the nucleophilic attack is you form the tetrahedral. So this is our tetrahedral intermediate, intermediate. And then what happens is we lose a leaving group. Well, what are the possible leaving groups? We examine this compound, you know, the possible leaving groups would be the methoxy, okay, as a methoxide, obviously the, the chloride, because that's what they're showing leaving, and then the phenyl. Well, we're not going to lose the phenyl, because that's a poor leaving group. The phenyl with a negative charge, that would be the conjugate base of a super weak acid, so that's definitely not leaving. And then if you compare methanol versus HCl, which one's a stronger acid? HCl is a stronger acid, therefore chloride is a better leaving group. So it's the one that's going to scram. It's the one that's going to leave. And we end up making an ester. So we could even practice our ester nomenclature here. So what would this ester be called? Here's our methyl group. So we would call this methyl. And this part comes from benzoic acid. So this would be methyl, methyl benzoate. All right, so there's our nucleophilic acyl substitution between an acid chloride and methoxide. Now, just in terms of the mechanism, um, remember, this is not an SN2 reaction. Okay? It is not a concerted mechanism. It is not nucleophilic attack followed by, or, or, or with loss of leaving group occurring simultaneously. It's not an SN2. Remember, you have to form the tetrahedral intermediate. And sometimes, especially when you're looking at things like esters and amo, uh, mostly esters, you're going to have to do a proton transfer in the first step. Why? Because as we've seen many times throughout this course, if you're in acidic conditions, you're never going to form something with a negative charge. If you're under basic conditions, you're not going to make a lot of cations in there. And thus, we have to be sure that our, co our conditions and our mechanism is consistent with our conditions. Check this out. Look at this reaction right here. This is called the acid hydrolysis of an ester. Acid hydrolysis, hydrolysis of an ester. Very important reaction in organic chemistry. Now, it might be a knee-jerk reaction for you to say, well, I've got water. It's a nucleophile. It comes in and it attacks. Uh, but hold on. If you were to draw that, and it's drawn down here, that would be, this is incorrect, okay? Why is that incorrect? Because the intermediate that you get shows a negative charge on an oxygen. That's not good. We don't start drawing negative charges if we're in acid, right? We're in acidic conditions. So what must happen first? If we protonate the carbonyl to make an oxonium, now you've rendered it even more electrophilic and if the nucleophilic attack occurs on this oxonium, so now if our water comes in, we end up with a positively charged intermediate. Let me show you. Check this out. Here we have the oxonium. And now when the nucleophile attacks, here's our tetrahedra tetrahedral intermediate. Look, it's positively charged. There's no negative charges anywhere. Something that I didn't show you exactly was the activation energy. So if we go back here, you can see that the activation energy to form this intermediate that has a negative charge on the oxygen is just humongous. Whereas if you compare that to the activation energy of the nucleophilic attack after the carbonyl has been protonated, you see it's very small now. So it's much more reasonable. All right. So under basic conditions, however, you don't need to protonate the carbonyl. Now, this would be the basic this would be the first step, I guess, of the basic hydrolysis of an ester. There's nothing wrong with this. Why? Because you're starting with a negatively charged base and you're ending up with a tetrahedral intermediate that has a negative charge. That's fine. So again, the activation energy is low. You have to be sure that you're cons 
that your mechanism is consistent with the conditions you are employing. Now, when the amine is a nucleophile, then it gets to be a little different. So an amine as a nucleophile does not require the carbonyl to be pronated first. It's just going to attack the carbonyl. It's a good enough nucleophile that it can just go ahead and do it. And you end up forming a neutral, end up forming a neutral tetrahedral intermediate. All of this is you're like, oh man, I'm tired. What are you going on about, Mr. Dion? What is all this stuff about attacking and nucleophiles and all this? And I've seen nucleophilic attacks many, many times. You know, I get it, I get it. The whole point behind this, this is a real Dr. Klein thing, the author of the textbook. He really stresses the point of making sure to avoiding intermediates, to avoid students drawing intermediates that are incorrect, right? Because when you do that, that's when you start drawing mechanisms that are incorrect. If you understand that you can't draw certain intermediates, it will usually lead you in the correct path towards drawing the correct mechanism. That's one of the things I like about organic chemistry. Now, I know that we're all different, and I understand that not everybody's passionate about organic chemistry. That's totally fine. But what I like about organic chemistry is that sometimes, even with a little bit of knowledge, you can figure things out just by your understanding. Uh, proton transfers are utilized in mechanisms. Why? To remain consistent with the conditions we employ. We even saw that earlier today when we did some practice in chapter 19, when we practiced drawing that cyclic uh, compound being formed, okay? Um, in under acidic conditions, we can have up to three proton transfers. Now, I don't recommend memorizing this. I don't think it's helpful to do that. I think it's just good to practice drawing mechanisms in acidic, neutral, or basic conditions and making sure that your steps are consistent with the environment in which you're running your mechanism. Let's take a look at a mechanism. This is a funny reaction here. It always makes me chuckle when I look at this reaction. One of the first jobs I ever had in the lab was working with a guy named Bruce, and he used to take this compound, acetyl chloride, acetyl chloride, which is a super wicked powerful electrophile. As soon as it gets hit with water in H2O, it makes acetic acid, but at the same time, it makes a huge bang. It goes like, pow, pow. Right when it hits the water, because the reaction happened so fast, and he used to scare me. I'd be washing the dishes or doing something, and he'd go in the other sink and he'd start pouring acetyl chloride in it, and thought it was funny. It's not funny, okay? But uh, that's how fast the reaction goes. So if you put an acid chloride in water, it needs no help. This is such a good nucleophile, or, or good enough nucleophile, I should say, and this is such a powerful electrophile that the nucleophilic attack just happens like crazy. And then the chloride is going to leave because it's the weaker base. And then water comes in and does a proton transfer to make, to make uh, the carboxylic acid. So that's kind of the first reaction that we look at for a carboxylic acid derivative. It's just the, the nucleophilic attack of water on an acid chloride. Very fast, fast reaction. So with that in mind, why don't we see if we can draw a reasonable mechanism for both of these reactions here, okay? So we're taking an acid chloride and we're treating it with an acetate. Well, an acetate has a negative charge right on it. It's a good nucleophile, right, if it's negatively charged. So let's start by drawing out the acid chloride. We know the carbon is strongly electrophilic. We've got a nucleophile. I'm just going to draw it in this orientation. It's got a negative charge on it. I'm going to leave out the counter ion. The sodium. So I've got my nucleophilic attack and I'm going to form my tetrahedral intermediate. Let's draw that. We're going to have a negative charge on the oxygen. We've still got the chlorine attached and now we've got our oxygen with this carbonyl on it over here. So what are my options? I'm not going to lose a carbanion. I could lose the acetate, but it's a stronger base then chloride, right? Chloride is the conjugate base of a stronger acid, of the strongest. So we're going to lose the chloride like this, and we're going to end up with an anhydride. We're going to end up with propano uh, propanoic anhydride or propionic anhydride. Either way, both names are correct. And for the next one, for 
taking the acid chloride and we're treating it with a amide, or sorry, an amine to make an amide, a primary amide. We know that this is very powerful electric. This is a very powerful electrophile. The nitrogen doesn't need any kind of help to attack. So let's just draw a mechanism. Maybe I'll move this down a little bit. Put our lone pair in, and we're going to do a nucleophilic attack. And let's draw the intermediate that's formed. So we end up with our isopropyl group. Here's our oxygen with a negative charge. We've got our chlorine over here. And we've got our nitrogen, which has three hydrogens, one, two, three, attached to it. So it has a positive charge like this. Now, what's the weakest base here? What are we going to lose as a leaving group? It's going to be the chloride. So we're going to, maybe I can fix that. We're going to lose the chloride and reform the pi bond. Let's do that. We end up with our carbonyl. Now we've got a nitrogen with one, two, three hydrogens. It still has a positive charge, but we ended up forming chloride, and the chloride can come along and pick up a proton, but we also have ammonia in the solution, and so ammonia is going to be a better base, a stronger base. So ammonia is what's going to pick up the proton here, this, to form our primary amide. So let's Put in our primary amide and just like that. So what we're going to start on Monday morning, we'll be looking at the preparation of acid chlorides. How do you make an acid chloride? Then we're going to talk about how an acid chloride can react with an alcohol. Talk about how an acid chloride can react with an amine. We're going to talk about reductions of acid chlorides to primary alcohols. We'll talk about reduction of acid chlorides to aldehydes. Then we're going to, oh, two more, we talk about um, the reaction between an acid chloride and a green yard, which is similar, similar to that with an ester. And then we talk about what are called a Gilman reagent or a cuprate. We sometimes call a Gilman reagent a cuprate. And we'll talk about uh, the Gilman reaction or a Gilman reagent or a cuprate and how that works. And so the first thing we're going to do on Monday is kind of get to the end of all of this. We're going to take a look at all of these reactions in section 20.8 in detail. Some of the mechanisms you need to know, some of them not so much or not at all really, and I'll guide you through that exactly which are the ones that are most important for chemistry 3111 students. And then if you read through the remainder of the chapter this weekend, what you'll find is that once you get to anhydrides and then finally esters and amides, that a lot of these reactions are going to be very similar with maybe a few nuances that are just you know slightly different. So I would strongly encourage you to do that over the weekend.